Let's start with uh, welcoming everyone again. My name is Beatrice Nobua Berman. I'll be your host today. I work at the UC Cooperative Extension as an urban forestry advisor. And we have today uh, Randall Oliver and Jolie Clark, also from uh, UC Cooperative Extension, and uh, Ricky Lara, which will be our presenter today. He is a senior environmental scientist and specialist with the California Department of Food and Agriculture. He's a research entomologist by training. He specializes in the development of classical biological control programs targeting invasive arthropod species. And part of his research responsibilities include conducting foreign explorations in search of natural enemies of invasive target pests and studying the environmental safety of these natural enemies in quarantine lab for their release here in the US. Some of his pest control projects have involved working with ambrosia beetles, sting bugs, and spider mites. So welcome, Ricky. Uh, we appreciate having you here and take it over. OK, thank you, Bea. I want to start off by uh, thanking everybody, the, uh, the people who are attending, and also the organizers for being allowing me to be part of the lunchtime talk. Well, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I work for CDFA and I'm part of the biological control program here. What I'm hoping to do today is to give you a broad overview of the efforts that are underway in California to promote proactive classical biocontrol of invasive insects. And there's three that I want to emphasize during this session. One is the work that's being done with the um, uh, Emerald Dashboard, so it's a beetle, EAB. The other one uh, is focused on spotted lanternfly, which is a hemipteran organism. And then the other one is a moth known as Tuta absoluta. So for this presentation, I'm first going to set the stage by talking about the importance of invasive species, why they matter. And then I'm going to go and discuss how biological control as a practice has been used in the past, is currently being used, and can continue to be part of the viable uh, part of the viable solutions that we use to deal with invasive species. And then I'm going to transition into talking about the proactive efforts that are being devoted to Emerald Dash Borer, the Spotted Lanternfly, and Tuta. And then I'll end by making some general uh, conclusions. So the first question I want to address is what are invasive species? When we talk about invasive species, uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm referring to non-native species that have been introduced into an area intentionally or unintentionally due to human uh, action. Uh, and these are species that can cause significant economic and environmental harm, and they may pose a risk to human health. This is an important topic for us here in California because a number of invasive, of invasive species have been going up over time. On an annual basis, we acquire nine exotic organisms that are not native, and then some of those go on to become uh, problematic. Some of the issues that are generated by the invasive species are that they feed on our, the foods that we grow, so our specialty crops. They can also pollute wilderness areas. They can damage fragile habitats. They can extirpate native species, and they can also spread disease. And they themselves can be uh, a nuisance in, in some areas. Overall, the damage and losses that are attributed to invasive species add up to $138 billion uh, per year. I'm very fortunate that I'm part of CDFA, and then within CDFA, I'm part of the Pest Prevention, uh, sorry, Pest Plant Health and Pest Prevention Services Division. Uh, and this division is tasked with the mission of protecting California from the threat of exotic pests. Um, and so as a result, PHPPS oversees many pest activities. So that can in involve, for example, evaluating the risk of invasive species to California, uh, implementing statewide surveys to track the presence of these exotic organisms. It can also involve inspecting commodities to ensure that they are pest-free. And it can also involve uh, engaging in eradication efforts. Um, and this also can in involve the use of biological uh, control. One of, the, um, one of the branches that I want to highlight that's part of the PHPPS division is the pest exclusion branch. So that branch is involved with restricting the movement of um, materials that might be, that might harbor some of the exotic, some of these exotic organisms. Um, and so these activities are conducted 
at both state borders and at internal locations that are likely to be pathways for some of these non-native uh, species. So within that program, I wanted to sort of highlight the California Border Protection Stations. This particular program uh, operates 16 stations that are located um, along the state's northern and eastern boundaries on each major highway entry point into California from other states. So what they do is that they ensure that material like vehicles and other commodities that are being brought into California are pest free and that commodities that are coming into the state are also in compliance with any plant quarantine restrictions. On an annual basis, um, 20 million vehicles, private vehicles are inspected um, and 7 million commercial vehicles are also inspected. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of vehicles that are examined. Um, the benefit of this is that for every dollar spent on prevention, that generates approximately $14 saved in pest control. And then over time, those benefits can accrue to become millions of dollars that can then be used to target other uh, problems generated by invasive uh, organisms. Um, so when some organisms do become established, um, that can often also necessitate the need to uh, implement integrated pest management. IPM is, a, is an ecosystem-based approach that considers information on the biology of the pest and also their interaction with components of the environment. So often the implementation of IPM involves the use of things like biological control, chemical control, and also cultural control. Um, I have the fortune of being able to specialize in biological control, and I'm part of the CDFA's bio biocontrol program, which has been in existence since the 1970s. Um, I also want to spend some time in defining what biocontrol is. So uh, biocontrol uh, is the intentional use of natural enemies. So I can include things like predators, parasitoids, and pathogens. And these natural enemies are used to reduce the densities of insect pests and uh, noxious, noxious weeds. Um, biocontrol is a global scientific strategy that's been around formally for um, 100 years um, and has been used successfully uh, in California to target a variety of different uh, organisms. So two other highlights include, for example, the use of the Vigala beetle that was imported in Australia during the 1880s. Um, and that virtually saved the citrus industry from the damage that was being caused by the cottony cushion scale. Another good example is the use of a Chrysomella beetle that was imported in the 1940s, and that was being used for biocontrol of St. John's uh, wort here in the state. Um, so if you don't hear about these pests anymore, it's because they're no longer a problem, and that's thanks to the, uh, the use of classical biological control. However, I do also want to spend some time um, sort of highlighting that biological control is a dynamic practice. There are different types of biological control strategies, and these refer to how natural enemies are sourced and how they're used in the field. So the ones that I've highlighted here in blue refer to biocontrol practices that rely on resident natural enemy species that are already present in the, env in the environment, so they're resident species. Um, and it can also include species that are available commercially for release in a particular uh, area. The type of biological control that I practice is classical biological control. And this requires the use of um, natural enemies that are sourced from the native range of an invasive species, and then they're brought into California. And you're probably wondering, well, why do we have to bring something else? And the reason is, is that sometimes the native natural enemies that we have here are not sufficient because they do not have a coevolutionary history. So for that reason, we have to source the agents that have a coevolutionary history with the pest, and then we try to restore that relationship in the um, invaded range. We also have to keep in mind that California is a hotspot for invasions because we have a nice Mediterranean climate. We grow a variety of different crops. Um, and so sometimes those natural enemies that are present here may not be sufficient. Um, but classical biological control is a rigorous process because we're introducing a new species. Uh, we have to make sure that we're following a series of steps. So the first step is making sure that we have selected the appropriate target, the target pest. So we have to determine whether biological control is suitable to target that individual. 
So first step is, is that particular pest that we're targeting causing significant ecological and economic damage? And also we have to take into account the likelihood that the biological control efforts are going to succeed long-term. If we happen to identify a good suitable target, the next step is then to conduct surveys in the native range of that pest, and we're looking for co-evolved natural enemies. And this requires a lot of cooperation, not only with agencies here in, in the US at the state and the federal level, but also requires uh, cooperation with um, individuals uh, in the native in the in the areas where these pests originate. So that can include also university um, and also government um, organizations. After we conduct the foreign exploration, then we have to then bring those natural enemies with permits back to the U.S. And the whole purpose of that is to initiate the host specificity testing, and that's done in a USDA certified corning facility. And the purpose of doing the host specificity is to gather critical scientific data that's going to allow us to um, study the host specificity of the biocontrol agent and to assess the risk to non-target organisms. And those types of studies can take several, several, several years. Um, after that data is collected, then if the results are encouraging and the natural enemy that we're considering is would do a good job in the um, environment, then that petition is submitted to a federal regulatory agency, um, which is likely to be USDA. Um, they will review the petition, um, and then they will also create an environmental assessment. Assuming that all the results are showing that the agent would uh, generate, um, be a significant benefit in the invaded range of this particular organism, they will then issue a finding of no significant impact. But the work is not is not done. So as responsible biocontrol practitioners, we have to then rear the agent, figure out how to do that cost effectively, and then release it. And then we have to monitor the agent's establishment. We have to look at the spread of the agent and also begin to look at the impact to make sure that the agent is doing what we said it's going to do, which is to reduce densities of the um, invasive organism. Now, this can be very challenging because doing classical biological control, you know, can take at least a minimum of maybe 10 years because of all the challenges and all the research that has to get done. Um, and also making sure that we're in compliance with any regulatory process. Um, however, invasive species don't sleep. The threat of invasive species continues to, to be an ever-present problem, especially here in California. We're very fortunate, however, that CDFA has created opportunities to engage in proactive biological control so that we can keep up with the threat of these imminent pests. So one of those programs that provides funding for bio proactive biocontrol is the Proactive Integrated Pest Management Solutions Program. And that program is managed by the Office of Environmental Farming and Innovation. And the great thing about that is that it's really giving California growers and also stakeholders a head start in preparing for priority invasive species. And so I'm going to start getting into some examples of projects that have been funded by the Proactive IPM Solutions. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is the Emerald Dash Borer. And this particular picture, what I'm showing you is sort of a, a close-up of this beautiful green metallic uh, beetle. Uh, in reality, however, the beetle is small. It's approximately um, half an inch in length and then 1 16th of an inch uh, wide. But one beetle is not the problem. It's the aggregate impact that they can have on a tree when they begin, um, begin to feed. This particular beetle has a scientific name of Agrilus planipennis. It's a buprested beetle. Uh, other beetles in this particular family are also known for being metallic, but Agrilus is not native to North America. It's native to Asia. And it was first detected in the US in Michigan in 2002. From there, you know, despite strong quarantine efforts and efforts to eradicate it, those were not successful. So the beetle has now been able to spread to 36 states and it's not present in California. And you're probably wondering, well, why should we care if it's not here yet? Well, you know, this beetle is a threat um, to um, the native fractinous trees or the ashes that we have here in, in North America. And then last year in 2002, it showed up in neighboring Oregon. Um, 
And what's also been shown is that this beetle can lead to the eventual death of the ash tree. And so that process takes approximately two to five years. So in the picture that you're seeing here, you're seeing a, a stand of ash trees that's been killed by emerald ash borer. And so the ecological and economic impact of the beetle can exceed $10 billion in the, uh, in the US. Um, I also wanna spend some time talking about the life cycle of emerald, of emerald ash borer. Um, so you can appreciate just sort of how the beetle works and how it can cause damage. So in the eastern U.S., emerald dash borer has one generation per year. The adults are going to emerge in the spring. They're going to feed on the foliage. They're then going to mate, and then they're going to begin laying eggs. A single female can lay approximately 60 to 90 eggs on the bark of the ash trees. And then these eggs are small, they're less than one millimeter uh, in size, and they're gonna, pr uh, they're gonna hatch to produce individual larvae that will chew their way into the tree. Um, and then they're gonna begin feeding on the phloem and the cambium. Uh, the larvae are cream colored. They have sort of these bell-shaped body segments. And as they feed, um, they're going to, as they feed during the summer, they're going to create these S-shaped or serpentine galleries. And they're also going to grow in size. In the fall, the larvae are then going to create these chambers where they will fold up into a pre-pupal state and they're going to overwinter. But in the following year, in the spring, they're going to pupate and then the adults are going to emerge to repeat uh, the cycle um, again. Um, in some situations, however, some of the larvae are not able to reach their full uh, maturity as larvae. So they're gonna require a second summer and then emerge the following uh, spring. So it may take up to two years for them to complete the egg to adult development. I did mention that the adults feed on the foliage. That is the least of our concerns. The stage that is killing the tree is the larvae because as they're forming these galleries, they're basically disrupting the tree's ability to transport water and nutrients. And so that tree then will begin to die. Usually the damage begins at the top um, in the canopy. Uh, and then you'll start seeing symptoms where the tree is starting to lose the foliage. So it looks like dieback. By the time that you start noticing uh, the beetles uh, visually um, where, where they can be observed, uh, it's probably a little bit too, too late. Um, I also wanted to share with you a guide that was put together by the Oregon Department of Agriculture for lookalikes of emerald ash borer. So there are several insects that can look like uh, EAB in terms of the color, that metallic green, and also in that uh, general shape. Um, and so this guide from ODA includes some beetles, some stink bugs, um, some hymenopteran insects, and also one leaf hopper. However, there's only one true emerald ash borer. Um, and it can be very difficult to identify, um, but I did find a resource or one diagnostic feature that seems to maybe you know be good and be a, a general diagnostic character for this particular beetle, and that's um, that emerald ash borer is the only agrarian species in North America with the dorsal surface of the abdomen that's brightly metallic red. But even this feature can be very difficult because in some specimens of agrarian or other beetles, the wings can also give off that color. So if you're not really opening the removing the the wings to look at the abdomen, it can be confusing. In any case. If you ever happen to find something in California that you think might be emerald ash borer, <laughs> please call the CDFA pest hotline at the number shown uh, because you know we have experts here at the Plant Pest Diagnostic Center in Northern California that are trained to identify a lot of insects um, that occur in California, both native and also um, invasive. In terms of what's at risk in California, I want to spend some time here. So in North America, we have 16 native uh, fraxinus species, and there's five that occur in California. So that includes uh, dwarf ash, that includes uh, California ash, Oregon ash, chaparral ash, and also velvet ash. Um, and we're concerned because these ash trees are important in the ecosystem. So we're noticing that in the Eastern US, uh, emerald ash borer can have a devastating ecological impact. And that's because there's things, for example, like wildlife, wildlife that depend on, uh, on the consumption of ash, of ash foliage. There's also, when you have an aggregation or a lot of uh, dead trees, 
those trees can also be fuel for wildfire. And we don't want that here, especially in California. And the other uh, important thing to highlight is that trees, these ash trees can play an important role in riparian habitats and providing stability to those areas. Um, in urban areas, um, you know, aside from the fact that some of these trees can also provide ash, um, removing a dead, a dead tree can also be costly to uh, residents and, and homeowners. Um, and they can also, if you start seeing a lot of uh, dead ash trees, that can really limit the ability of municipalities to respond to the spread of this particular uh, organism. Um, another concern for California is that there was some work that was done in Washington state that was showing that the beetle, the emerald ash borer, could complete its part of its development on cultivated olive. And that's a concern for us because California produces 90% of commercial olives in the nation. So we definitely do not want emerald ash borer. Um, in terms of signs and symptoms, I'm gonna go over this, um, some, some, some of the general um, indicators that you might be dealing with an emerald ash borer infestation. One of the first things to look for is the, the dieback. So as I mentioned before, some of the infestations of emerald ash borer will begin in the canopy, and then you'll start seeing this dieback. As a result, the tree is going to become stressed and it's, it's going to start producing these epicormic shoots from the roots or the trunk. And you can also see some of these larger than normal leaves. Um, and so that's being displayed here in uh, this forefront in this forefront tree and also here in the in the back, the dieback here, and then the epicormic uh, shoots. Um, in terms of the beetles themselves, when the adults are emerging, they'll chew their way and then they're going to form these D-shaped uh, exit holes. And if we also look underneath the bark, you'll start seeing these serpentine galleries that have been created by, um, by, the, by the beetle. Something else to look out for is the presence of woodpeckers. That's not only true for, for, for emerald ash borer, but also other agrarian species. Sometimes on their respective host plants, you'll see woodpeckers, and that's because they're looking for the immature emerald ash borer stages, and they're trying to feed. And so you'll see, um, you can see the D-shaped exit holes where the beetles have uh, emerged, but you can also see some of these pecking holes where a woodpecker was able to um, grab on to that, to the insect and feed on it. Uh, but it's not all gloom. I do want to share some positive news. So there have been some classical biological control efforts that have, um, are proving to be successful. So there are four parasitoids that have been sourced by USDA from Asia, and that's part of the native range of emerald ash borer. And if you remember from the other slide, I walked you through those six general steps of, you know, um, selecting a target pest and then doing the field releases. They already, USDA already spent a significant amount of time doing that. So we're now at the stage where the specificity has been completed. The agents have been uh, approved for field release. And now USDA has been rearing and releasing uh, those parasitoids in, um, in uh, the US for several years. And that was some of the work that was led by Dr. Julie Gould uh, with USDA and other cooperators. Uh, so she spent a number of years working on this particular project to make it happen. Uh, the four superstars here are the these agents that I'm showing here. So it includes uh, one egg parasitoid, Obius agrilli, and then three larval parasitoids, uh, Spathius galini, Spathius agrilli, and the Trastichus Uh With the Obius agrilli, that particular parasitoid will attack the egg, and then from each egg, you're going to get one uh, parasitoid. The cool thing about the other parasitoids are that they are gregarious larval parasitoids. So they attack the larvae, and then from a single emerald dash or uh, larvae, you can expect to get multiple um, multiple parasitoid offspring. Um, in addition to that, they also have a faster development, so you can get also multiple generations. Uh, whereas I mentioned before, emerald dash borer only has one generation uh, per year. There's also some cool nuances with these parasitoids. So for example, Tetrasticus planipanisi has a shorter ovipositor. So that means that it can do a better job in attacking emerald ash borer and ash trees that are of a smaller diameter. By comparison, the Spathius galini has a longer ovipositor. So it's able to do a better job in detecting emerald ash borer um, in the more mature trees that have a thicker, uh, thicker bark. And it has the long ovipositor to physically enable it to reach that particular, um, that particular uh, larva. Um, 
some other things I wanted to share with you. So this map is basically showing that these parasitoids have been released in multiple EAB infested states. And those releases have started in 2007 and continue to be done. Um, and then the other positive news is that there's also been recovery of those parasitoids. So these are early indicators that the parasitoids uh, can become established in the US. And then Oregon is also planning to do releases later uh, this year of these parasitoids. Um, so you're probably wondering, well, what are we going to do here in California if the Emerald dashboard isn't here yet? So there are things that we can do proactively. So there, this project, like I mentioned before, is one of the ones that's funded by the Proactive IPM Solutions Grant Program. So we do have some funding for that. And some of the things we're going to be working on include um, initiating the paperwork with CDFA and also with collaboration with other agencies to facilitate facilitate the future conditional importation of Emerald Dashboard parasitoids into California. Uh, the second component is to also have a better understanding of the ash resources here in California. And so I'm particular, particularly interested in identifying and characterizing ash habitats that would be suitable for uh, release of the parasitoids should we ever get Emerald Dashboard. Um, so we're going to be following some of the guidelines that USDA has already generated to be able to identify some of these sites. Um, and then last but not least, we're also going to be looking at the presence of native parasitoids. So we really need to document, you know, the types of natural enemies of euprested beetles so we can have a better idea of the basal levels of biotic resistance that are present in some of these ash habitats. Um, in other states where emerald ash borer has been detected, there have been documentation of native parasitoids. However, they have not been able to um, really control the pest. And you can see that because the, the beetle has been able to spread. But there have been some case studies where um, some of the native parasitoids seem to be um, effective, at least at the, at the local level. So these are three of the components that we're going to be uh, pursuing um, in California as part of this project. Now, in terms of what are some of the things that people can do proactively, um, so CDFA is supportive of two campaigns aimed at preventing the spread of invasive species, and that's done by educating the general public on how they can be active participants in keeping California safe from forest and agricultural pests. So one of them is the buy it where you burn it, which essentially is to you know, tell people that not to move firewood from location to location, and also to buy or collect the wood in the areas where they intend to use it. And then the second one is a don't pack a pass, which is intended to educate travelers to not pack agricultural products um, or other plant derived material that might um, carry um, some of these exotic uh, organisms. So I'm going to leave that there and then I'm going to transition into talking about spotted lanternfly. Um, so this here is a picture of the adults. They're about one inch in length. And then the four wings are a gray, gray toned with dark spots. Um, in, invaded area, in invaded areas, it's not uncommon to see large aggregations of the, um, of the spotted lanternfly. Um, and that's when they're, when they're feeding on, on, the, on the host plants. I do want to clarify, however, that contrary to the second part of their name, the lanternfly, these things do not emit light and they're not flies. They're not true flies. They're not in the order Diptera. These, uh, this insect is a member of the order Hemiptera and they're in the family Fulgori. The scientific name is like Horma delicatula and it was first detected in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014. Um, and it's now been spreading to 14 states. Um, California has begun preparing for this insect by creating a state exterior quarantine, which is basically designed to uh, restrict the movement of some materials or commodities that might harbor some of these um, life stages of spotted lanternfly. Um, something else that's also interesting is that some of the infestations in the Eastern US appear to be associated with transportation corridors. That's why in California, the border stations play an important role in making sure that things like spotted lanternfly not enter the uh, state. I also want to briefly go over the spotted lanternfly life cycle. Um, so in the eastern U.S., spotted lanternfly has one generation per year. During the late summer into early winter, the adult females are going to lay uh, the egg masses. And these have sort of have a brown-gray uh, coloration. 
um, and the eggs are an average of 30 to 50 eggs, and the females can lay approximately two egg masses each. Um, the complicated part is that sometimes those females will lay those eggs on not only on plant material, but can they also lay them on other types of surfaces like plastic um, or metal. Um, those eggs are going to overwinter and they're going to hatch the following spring to produce nymphs. And these are going to go through four instar stages. The first three are black and white, and then the other ones are red with, um, with also white and black uh, markings. Um, and then as they acquire nutrition, they're going to then turn into, um, into uh, adults. I did want to emphasize that because the egg masses can be laid on a variety of different surfaces uh, it's, and it's not moving and it sometimes can escape notice, it's, it's very important to keep an eye out for these, especially on material that's coming into, um, into California and folks at the border stations make sure that they keep an eye, um, keep an eye on that. Um, another feature of SLF that I want to highlight is that it is polyphagous, so it feeds on a variety of different plants. Um, those can include plants that are agricultural, these are specialty crops, or things that are ornamental, horticultural, and also other plants that are native to North America. The two that I want to talk about are grape and tree of heaven. Grape is important because it is a specialty crop, um, and it's valued at more than $5 billion in, um, in California. And then when you look at the industry, both for the wine um, and, for the, uh, and for the production of grape, that sector generates more than $50 billion in California. So we want to um, protect that industry from the threat of spotted lanternfly. Um, spotted lanternfly is a phloem uh, feeder. So it uses its piercing sucking mouth parts. And then as it's doing that, it's basically robbing the plant of nutrients, which, all, which also ends up weakening the plant and can affect yield. Something else that it does is also produces a significant amount of honeydew. So that honeydew then is deposited on the leaves and then that creates conditions that are conducive to sooty mold. And then that reduces the, um, the photosynthesis surface area and that can also damage um, or be harmful to the plant like, like the grapevine. Um, Tree of Heaven is something else that we have to talk about. Tree of Heaven is a preferred host plant for spotted lanternfly. Um, and it's another noxious weed it's, or noxious plant. It's not native to, um, to North America, it's native to Asia and it's widely distributed. And so the concern with, spotted light with Tree of Heaven is that it can facilitate the, the spread of SLF. Um, some of the characteristics of Tree of Heaven is that it can produce more, a tree, a single tree can produce more than 300,000 seeds annually. And then those seeds can remain viable in the soil. And then the, the tree can spread aggressively by sending out these root sprouts. Um, you know, managing Tree of Heaven can be very complicated. I did find, however, that Penn State Extension has a website that basically talks about different options for managing Tree of Heaven. Um, however, I did want to bring highlight to the possibility of biological control in the future. So there are efforts that are um, that are being led or that have um, have relevance for us here in in the U.S. So the, so there is a, a group affiliated with USDA um, that's looking at an aerophyte mite that has been found in Europe and looking at the possibility of using it to weaken or to limit the growth of Tree of Heaven. There's also a fungus, a verticillium uh, nanofalfi, that's being explored uh, for its ability to um, interfere with the vascular system of Tree of Heaven and to limit its, limit its growth as well. Um, in terms of the risk of spotted lanternfly established in California, some of those models already suggest that the um, that this particular insect can establish in various parts of California, including the coast, the Central Valley, um, and other and other areas as well. Um, some of the plants, like I said before, that we're concerned with are the grapevines and also the Tree of Heaven. And there's various pathways for the organism to enter uh, California. Um, in terms of surveys, CDFA has been doing uh, high-risk surveys, and they've been basically also following the recommendations of, of um, partners in other states. And then visual surveys are the key, one of the key ways to detect, um, to detect this particular um, organism. Um, the faster that we find it, if it ever gets here, it's the better because that increases our chances of eradicating this particular, um, this particular insect. 
Now, in terms of what California is doing to proactively prepare for spotted lantern fly, there's a couple of things. Like I mentioned before, CDFA has a state exterior quarantine. Um, they're also um, conduct an annual SLF survey. Um, there's also, they also form the science advisory panel to get feedback from other experts on SLF. They also conduct outreach to industry. I've also um, was made aware that there's a training for master gardeners here in California. And there's a link for that um, that I can provide later. Uh, but something that's also key is CDFA is also very supportive of a variety of research, and that includes biological uh, control. Before moving to the next slide, I do want to say, however, is that if you do, again, find something like spotted lanternfly, you please report it to CDFA. Now, in terms of biological control, there are two uh, biocontrol agents that are being explored. One of them is uh, Anastatis orientalis. This is an egg parasitoid that's been sourced from China. And um, these the host specificity evaluations are being led by USDA. So far, though, there are, the lab results have not been enc encouraging because it's been shown that the parasitoid has a broad physiological host range. So it can attack uh, insects and other, uh, and other families, and that's not good. However, the USDA has also been working with collaborators in the native range of the parasitoid, and they've been trying to get a better understanding of the ecological host range. And they've seen that there is no evidence that the parasitoid um, will attack non-target species in its native range. And also in South Korea, where it was introduced for biocontrol of spotted lanternfly, they've also seen no evidence of non-target species being, um, being compromised or being at risk. Um, they are, however, looking at other strains of this parasitoid to see if they display differences in their host specificity. So under with the current information that we know, I uh, know showing that there's a broad physiological host range, release in California would be extremely, extremely limited. Um, it's unlikely at this point. Uh, the second agent very really quickly is uh, Draenus sinicus. It's another hymenopterian species. And this one's different from uh, the Anastatis orientalis in that it attacks the nymphs as one generation. And USDA uh, is currently um, establishing the rearing protocols, and they're also preparing to start the uh, host specificity studies. So there's some good news uh, there. So I'm going to end here with spotted lanternfly and then very uh, briefly go over some of the proactive biocontrol efforts that are being led for Tuta Absoluta. Uh, this work is being done by Dr. Uh, Brian Hogue. He's with USDA ARS in Northern California in Albany. Um, so he got funding from the Proactive IPM, and then we're I'm well the biocontrol program here is part of that of that project as well, and facilitating some of those efforts. So this particular slide, what I wanted to do is basically showcase that like other Lepidoptera it has an egg, larva, uh, pupa, and adult life stages. Um, unlike SLF and Emerald Ash Borer, this, the adult is not charismatic. It's not very colorful. It's a sort of tiny brown moth. Um, but we have people here at TDFA with the Plant Pest Diagnostic uh, Center who are trained to identify, um, identify these types of organisms. Um, one of the things about Tuta Absoluta is that it is a multi time pest, so that can have multiple generations um, per year. Now, if you haven't heard about Tuta, that's good because it's not in the U.S. yet, but this particular organism is native to South America. It was described in Peru in the early 1900s, but even in its native range, it's been able to spread to other areas where it was not known to occur. Um, and then in 2006, it was found in Europe and then began spreading to other parts, including Africa and also uh, Asia. Uh, in California or in the United States, we don't have it, but part of that has to do with the fact that we also have very strong vital sanitary um, requirements. So stuff that's being moved uh, from some of these countries have to meet certain criteria. Um, I did want to emphasize that Tuda is a significant pest of tomatoes. One female can lay more than 200 eggs. All stages of the plant can be attacked, including the fruit. And if nothing is done, that can result in 100% crop loss. We have to be very um, uh, vigilant that tuna doesn't get here because tomato production is very important in California. We grow uh, tomato on more than 300,000 acres, valued at more than $1 billion, uh, and that production is statewide. I do want to share some good news. We do have an agent in mind, a biocontrol agent. Um, that would be 
Dolicogenidia gelicidivorus. That's another hymenopteran parasitoid. And the cool thing about the parasitoid is that it can attack all the larval stages of Tuda absoluta with greater success on the early stages. Um, and in the picture shown here from A through E, you're seeing the larval stages of the, um, the egg and larval stages of the parasitoid when it's developing inside its um, inside the host, the moth host. Um, and then F is a picture of the adult. The, the great excellent thing about this is that UC already did some research with this particular parasitoid in the 1970s, and that allowed us to learn more about its geographic distribution. Um, and we're also able to get in contact with people in Colombia who are using the parasitoid already to control uh, Tuda absoluta there. And then currently, Dr. Brian Ho has, is collaborating with cooperators in Kenya. And so they're providing um, the parasitoid for him to do some of the host specificity studies. And these parasitoids originally came from, um, from South America. Now, our involvement with this project, I'm helping uh, search for some of the non-target Gilekeids. Um, and so that's taking us to different areas of California where we're looking for Gilekeids on host plants. So we've been looking on oak trees. We've been looking on coyote bush. Uh, we've also been doing some black bike trapping with UC Davis in habitats where we can, we're likely to find these Gelakias. Um, in terms of the host specificity testing, that's currently underway. That's being led again by Dr. Brian Hogue and his team. And then he currently has some Gelakias in colony. So that includes tomato pinworm and then potato tuber worm and then some, um, some, larvae, some larvae that he's also collected from lupins. And these are all. Um, related taxonomically to Tuda absoluta. Um, these two, however, tomato pinworm and potato tuber worm, they themselves are, are, are passed here in North, in North America. Uh, all this work is being done in a USDA corning facility. Um, and um, you know, hopefully by next year, we'll have some results that Dr. Brian Hope is going to be able to share. Um, so last but not least, some conclusions. Um, I wanna emphasize that invasive species remain a threat to California. They threaten our $50 billion agricultural industry. Um, and with the rise in the threat from these invasive organisms, we have to be proactive, not reactive. We can't wait for these things to get here. Um, so what I want to emphasize is that classical biological control is already a proven strategy in California. Um, and by continuing, to, by continuing to invest in classical biocontrol, we can diversify the range of biocontrol options that are available and then that helps to strengthen um, IPM and can help us also um, in a broader picture achieve sustainable pest management in California. So I wanna thank the following individuals and agencies and groups for their support. Um, and I can answer any questions you have. Thank you for your time. Julie, do you want to uh, ask some of the questions that are in the Q&A? Sure. We have, a, we have a few. And um, please, anyone else, um, add yours to the Q&A section. Um, Dr. Lara, um, how can we advocate for more workers at border control stations? Um, and the, the questioner adds that um, oftentimes, um, they're, they're unstaffed. CDFA is already looking into it um, to expand resources to make uh, make sure that there's more people at those um, at those stations. So it's something that has already been brought to CDFA's attention. Dr. Laura, could you also comment about the the CDFA um, kind of how they operate those border stations? Because I think there is potentially uh, indicated by this question some misunderstanding about. Who gets stopped at the station? What what do people um, that are at the station? What are they looking for? And and kind of like how far out can they see the people before they're coming in? So I'll start by saying that first of all, I don't work at the border station, so I have I I'm not exactly familiar with their protocol. But what I can say is that um, they're looking for any any signs or any indicators that there might be material um, that's likely to contain. Um, you know, harbor an invasive species. So for example, if there's a vehicle coming, for example, from Berks County, Pennsylvania, <laughs> that, you know, that vehicle, for example, uh, will be, will, will probably be inspected. Um, and also any type of commercial vehicle that's transporting a commodity, 
that material is also they're going to check with with the um, with the um, the individual transporting that material to make sure that there is that they're carrying the necessary um, paperwork to be able to transport that uh, that material. So, yeah. So there's a there's a lot involved. They receive the proper training to be able to um, to figure out you know what type of material poses a, a high risk. Um, so yes, I, I think there's some confusion in that people. Uh, from California, they've got California license plates, they're driving their personal car, and they go through the stations and they don't get stopped. So they think there's nobody there. And the, the fact is, they've, they've been seen, they've got the plates, they, they're driving a, a vehicle that is not of concern. And um, so they don't get stopped. But that doesn't mean that the next person that comes through with with some of the things that you just indicated, um, they're looking for that, they will be stopped. Thank you. Now, we have a related um, transportation question, and um, it's that TSA in California's airports no longer asks for plant materials. Do you know why? That I do not know. Maybe there's somebody, I don't know if there's somebody from CDFA who's on the, who's listening in, who can probably leave a comment in the, in the chat box, but I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Well, moving on, um, we have a couple of questions about um, Emerald Ash Borer. Berkeley has many Rayburn Ash street trees, um, and there seems to be a considerable amount of dieback in these trees. Um, do we know if Ash Borer might be there? Uh, as far as I'm aware, no, but the first thing I would say, get in touch, again, call the CDFA pest hotline uh, to call that in and you might be able to get more feedback. The other thing too, in terms of the ash resources, I'm gonna try to connect this with the, uh, yesterday's topic with Bea, she covered particip participatory science. Um, this might be an opportunity uh, to use Emerald Dashboard to increase um, collaboration or to en engage um, California residents. So if you're ever out in, in the environment, you happen to uh, be looking at ash or other, uh, for example, other spotted landerfly host plants, um, take a picture with your phone. You can also upload that information to iNaturalist. Um, and then because I use that information or other people at TDFA as well, they go through those records to see if there might be some organisms that are of, um, of interest. But getting back to that person who has the question, yes, please get in touch with TDFA um, and they can provide more advice on on what the next step should be. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question about um, spotted lantern fly. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I move to that, um, what is the ash density needed to consider parasitoid release? Um, it's not so much not, not so much a matter of density, but basically making sure that we have stable habitat. So for example, if you have somebody that has it's their ash trees on, on private property, there's no guarantee that those trees are not gonna get cut down. So we're looking for areas where, um, uh, where there's a, an indication that those trees are gonna be there. Um, and that also areas that are included in areas that are likely to be um, uh, are good establishment areas for emerald ash borer. Okay. Do we have um, do we have a California ash tree ID fax sheet for people who want to volunteer monitoring for EAB? No, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that's something that's been on my mind. So I want to reach out to other agencies to be able to put the re those resources because uh, that's a question that's come up before. It's like, oh, how do I identify ash? Which what do ash trees look like? So I've been looking into some of this. So if there's somebody on this call um, who works with one of these agencies, yes, it's something that needs to be developed. Um, and so, yeah, please, please, please get in touch. But uh, at the moment, I haven't come across any resource that's been tailored for uh, California. But going back to uh, Bayes' talk yesterday, it might be worthwhile doing some of that so that people are uploading information on iNaturalist, that we're doing it in such a way where the data can be uh, reliable. Yeah. And, and we have a response from uh, um, one of our, uh, our attendees who is a certified arborist and, and uh, comments that, um, that Ray, Raywood, they're finding that their company is finding Raywood ash trees are uh, susceptible to a fungal disease that, that shows dieback. So, and, and um, so there, yeah, lots of times um, stressors in trees can be 
either a combination or other causes as well. Um, okay, so um, one question about spotted lanternfly, and um, do you have any insights as to how its life cycle will vary in California's warmer climate? That I don't know. I do know that, uh, I, I forgot to mention this, UC Riverside is the one leading the efforts on the proactive biological control, so they probably have a better grasp on this. But yes, it's something that potentially could be um, could be looked into a little bit further in, in terms of getting more nuance and and how the um, how climate might impact the um, the the life cycle of this pest. But it's possible that in some areas uh, they might have be capable of achieving more than one generation uh, per year. So yes, that is an important thing that needs to be to be looked at. Before we go into the next question, uh, and because it's already almost one, I wanted to let people know that Randall put in the chat our survey, our exit survey. If you would not mind, uh, complete that as a few questions. It takes very short time and it will really help us. Um, so please, if you can um, fill out that survey um, before leaving. And I want to let everyone know, um, say thank you for everyone who came to this webinar. And because it's one, um, you know, we're sort of officially consider this concluded, but since uh, Dr. Lara um, has graciously agreed to stay a little bit longer to answer um, any more questions, if you want, you're welcome to stay with us and listen to the rest of the answers to the questions from the public. But um, I just wanted to let people know that um, this, that we're done if you need to go. <laughs> um, we're not gonna be having any more presentation, right? Um, you can keep going. Yeah. Um, Dr. Lara, um, a question about um, will the part of the 2050 Sustainable Pest Management Program provide be provided with additional funding to expand early detection rapid response programs at the borders? Sorry, I thought they were referring to the proactive IPM, but um, I think they're probably referring to the, the new vision for California for sustainable pest management. And I think right now, um, how that's going to trickle down and it's going to affect various programs is still, be, it's still, being, um, still being discussed. So yeah, but yeah, it, it would be good to see uh, more resources devoted to, um, to, um, to those prevention efforts. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a request for you to po repost the initial image that you had when you started your presentation today with photographs of the three focal species you talked about. Great. And we can just leave it there till we close out, and which will should be in just a, a minute or two, um, because we only have one uh, one unanswered question and the commenter um, was in in Georgia in the Athens area and and it's about invasive I don't know how juro or hudo spider j-u-r-o um, which is a problem there in eating native spiders do you know anything about that you can share about its status or westward movement I don't know what's going on with that. No. Hold on here. Let's see the question. I was in the, okay. Yeah, I, I see the question there. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know anything about that particular spider. I would have to, um, yeah, look into it. All right. Well, those are our questions and um, there were many comments thanking you in the chat and and um, we certainly appreciate your expertise in sharing about these emerging paths. I for one learned a lot today and, and we'll be taking the information out um, to the public. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.